Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to see so many faces here in the room. Um, I'm Rod Bell. I'm CEO of uh, CropLife South Africa. And on behalf of my team, CropLife South Africa team, uh, the Executive Council of uh, CropLife South Africa, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all to the CropLife South Africa Conference of 2022. Uh, as you would have seen, this uh, conference is a hybrid affair. Uh, we have some of you here in the auditorium with us today but the vast majority of our attendees are actually participating uh, remotely. So we also have the, uh, the virtual uh, component and they are joining us via live feed as we speak. So uh, welcome to everybody who's joined us virtually as well. Um, we're really excited that the attendees for the next two days of this conference uh, are joining us uh, from all different parts of the South African agricultural industry, uh, but also from all different parts of the African continent, uh, Europe, uh, and even the USA, so uh, we're really excited uh, about, um, about all of that. We have a great program for the next two days, but I really do encourage all of you to, uh, to participate. Uh, we are only going to learn from each other. We're only going to get as much out of the next two days as uh, everybody's going to put into it. So please, when we get to the uh, questions, when we get to the uh, uh, discussions, uh, really do participate, ask your questions, uh, and get involved. So to this end, uh, if you're in the auditorium today, once we get to those sessions, just raise your hand, and the facilitator of that session will call on you to make your comment or ask your question, uh, and uh, they will facilitate it that way. If you are a virtual attendee, uh, please type your question or your comment uh, in the section that you'll see uh, on the conference uh, page that you're looking at right now. And the facilitator will see your question or your comment pop up on a, a tablet that he or she will have sitting here. And they will then call on you to uh, either make your comment or ask your question or they will read it out on your behalf. Um, they will also, as facilitators, will make sure that they only bring those questions that are, are relevant to that uh, particular uh, discussion. So each of the sessions for the next two days is going to have a facilitator, as I say. Um, not only will they be watching the time to make sure that we don't go over in each session, they're also going to be asking questions, uh, posing them to, uh, to the presenters uh, and to the panellists. So we'll have some, uh, uh, some really inter good interaction uh, going forward there. Um, some of the presentations have been pre-recorded. Uh, we wanted to be prudent with that. Um, some of you who live in this part of the world know there was no electricity here for a few hours yesterday afternoon. So um, with everything being pre-recorded, it doesn't really matter. Um, if uh, power goes down, there is backup generator, so we can still uh, broadcast the presentations out. There will be some presentations that will be done live, but the majority of them have been, uh, been pre-recorded. Uh, the pre-recorded ones, don't worry, everyone who's pre-recorded will be joining us uh, virtually for the discussions. So uh, it's not that they're just presenting and you don't get to interact with them. They will be live uh, and joining us uh, uh, for what's uh, going to be hopefully some really good discussions. If you've had a good look at the agenda, you will notice that there's a, there's a common theme. Um, and we pull that out and say the common theme is stewardship. Um, you've all heard many of Gerard's presentations. You've all seen the Crop Life Stewardship Arch. So you know that in our industry association, everything we do has got a stewardship uh, component to it. Now, this is from discovery of a product up to its manufacture, up to shipping it around the world, up to transporting it in the country, but from your warehouse out to the farm. Uh, it's down to the responsible use of products on farm. Uh, it's even down to the collection of empty containers and also handling obsolete stock. So it, it really is uh, overarching as, uh, uh, as we've always said. So stewardship is critical, but one thing I'd like you to remember as we go through the next two days, stewardship does not just apply to your so-called traditional plant protection solution. Whether you're talking plant biotechnology or whether you're talking new biologicals, uh, they all have to be handled uh, within our stewardship principles. Also, you will hear from some of our speakers, especially this morning in the first session, um, we do not operate in South African agriculture in isolation. We are working on a, a, a global uh, agricultural industry, and uh, uh, global events are certainly impacting us. There's no doubt about that. You will hear this morning about globalization bringing many opportunities, 
But as we see with uh, current geopolitical issues, <laughs> many hurdles and problems as well. So um, our first session this morning is going to be uh, ably facilitated uh, by Wandile, Chief Economist at, at Agbers. Uh, Wandile will be our, our facilitator, take us through the, the first pre-recorded sessions uh, and then um, handle the discussion at the end. So again, whether you're in the room or you are joining us virtually, a very warm welcome on behalf of my team and the EXCO and we look forward to having you with us for the next two days. Wandile, over to you. Thank you, Rod, and uh, good morning to all of the colleagues joining us virtually and all of you in the auditorium. It's good to be here after a year of doing discussions virtually, so it's good to see um, so many familiar faces. The, the first session is an important one, as Rod was saying, because if you look at South Africa's agricultural sector, 1994 up until to today, in value terms and in volume terms, this is a sector that has doubled um, in size. And what has been at the core of that is the rise in productivity, the seeds, the agrochemicals, all of the excellent work that is done by the farming community to put us to the place that we are in. But at the core of that, we've also relied a lot on international trade. We are now, for example, at a place where South Africa's agricultural sector is exporting roughly 49% of what we produce in value terms. That is about $12.4 billion of products as of 2021. And I think then all of the other geopolitics that Rod was referring to that are happening in the world, they present a key risk and we need to monitor what's going on in the world if we are that dependent and we've grown so much over the past couple of decades depending on that global market. And I think the next speakers that we're having will help us um, illuminate some of those things that are happening. Our session, for example, will rely a lot on what's going on in the EU but we'll also reflect a bit on what's going on with the geopolitics that you are seeing in the Black Sea countries. And we have a couple of speakers, about four speakers, um, all of them eminent and well-established in their areas of research. And I think that everyone that is joining virtually as well here in the auditorium will benefit greatly from their insights. And to kick us off in this session of the international markets, it's gonna be Miss Julia, Dee Tommaso, who is CEO of CropLife International. And she'll be speaking about innovation in agriculture, which again has been at the core of the success, at least us South Africa, we've enjoyed over the couple of decades. Her presentation is pre-recorded, uh, but you're welcome to send us some questions. If you are watching visually, we will be able to raise those with her. And if you are in the hall, if you can just take notes as she speaks, we'll have an opportunity to raise those questions after her. So we're passing on now the part to Julia to go ahead. If you can just bring up Julia's presentation, please. Thank you. Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me to participate in your conference. I have fond memories of working with Unilever South Africa on sustainable sourcing with small old farmers in Port Elizabeth, and then in Durban and Job. I wish I could be with you in person, but hopefully one day soon. I'm delighted to see innovation at the forefront of your CropCon agenda, and I'm looking forward to my colleagues' presentations examining public policy perspectives on innovation, as well as the impacts felt closer to home here in South Africa. At CropLife International, our purpose is to advance innovation in agriculture for a sustainable future, and working with others play a leading role in enabling sustainable food systems. Against the backdrop of the conflict in Ukraine, food security has never been more vital, nor our role in supporting access to farm inputs more critical. With exports in difficulties, prices uh, continue to rise around the globe. Governments are re-evaluating their existing policies to maintain food security, with the major shift seen in the EU, who announced last week to delay a number of measures related to the Green Deal, announcing new ones, as well as joining the Coalition for Sustainable Productivity Growth, of which CropLife International is a member. 
It is imperative now that we champion the role of innovation and technology can play in addressing the paradox of producing more nutrition food for a growing population within planetary boundaries. Innovation in agriculture is key to ensure access to food by allowing farmers to produce more nutritious food while at the same time reducing emissions, halting biodiversity loss and improving rural community livelihoods. First, it's important that we know that innovation extends well beyond the boundaries of R&D and specific products. It can include how we structure our organizations, approach partnerships, generate ideas and optimize our decision making processes towards a particular outcome. It includes how we interact with our customer, both farmers and beyond, in co-creating solutions with them and continuously learning and improving through collaborations and partnerships. And regardless of the type of innovation, we must look at both near and long-term impact and efficacy. Innovation ultimately needs to generate positive impacts on the natural world and on people. Specific to our sector, we must focus on innovations that can make agriculture more resilient, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, while still allowing farmers to grow more nutritious food with less resources for a hungry world. On the product side, for example, scientists are developing even more drought tolerant and optimized hybrid maize varieties that are vital to the South African economy. These innovations have been the result of the years of strong partnerships with private and public institutions here in South Africa. Our industry is also pioneering new seed treatments and coatings to protect crops from pests and diseases to work in concert with improved seed varieties. Game-changing technology is emerging to help farmers adapt to unpredictable weather and disease. With digital agriculture, pests can be identified and the best and the most precise treatment can be effectively and timely determined. However, if we look at the scope of the challenge facing us, providing safe and more nutritious food to 9 billion people by 2050, it is clear we must do more beyond just individual product solutions. To drive the innovation we need requires significant investment and commitment from both the public and the private sectors, but also a forward thinking perspective, recognize that more of the same is not going to get us there. CropLife International and CropLife Network is in a unique position to help develop industry-wide innovations such as commitments, best practices and ways of working and champion their implementation. Along these lines, we should look towards cross-industry models that push forward the global goals such as zero hunger, carbon neutrality, nature positive and respecting and promoting human rights, as well as transformational partnerships that cultivate new innovation. For example, through our CropLife International and FAO partnership, we are working together to reduce the effects of pests like fall army worm, which can have devastating impacts on farm livelihoods and severely affect food security for vulnerable populations. By sharing information about new plant science innovation, technical expertise, we can work together to identify the most effective tools to mitigate the impact of plant pests. Working in partnerships with others frequently unlocks some of the best ideas and delivers a, a range of new and exciting innovations, new tools, new technology, new solutions to the complex challenge facing agriculture. We also have the opportunity to go beyond our traditional ways of working and promote industry commitments toward aspirational goals on plant sites product usage. South Africa has historically been a great example of integrated innovation in agriculture. Your vineyards are a great case study where numerous plant science solutions have been deployed to improve productivity 
while simultaneously enriching biodiversity between the vines and creating local economic opportunities through tourism and wine production. However, we cannot be happy with just innovation. It must be responsible innovation, grounded in sound science and good stewardship practices. Through our stewardship regulatory programs, CropLife International, in partnership with our CropLife Network, with CropLife uh, South Africa, leads the way in, pro in promoting the responsible use of plant science solutions to help deliver on global sustainability objectives, including safe disposal of obsolete stocks, empty container management, and launching our sustainable pesticides management framework, which equips farmers with technologies and practices to deliver innovative benefits and support climate mitigation and adaptation. Our members are leaders in responsible innovation. They demonstrate this by evaluating all new innovations in their portfolio through a lens that considers potential for climate change adaptation and mitigation, impacts on biodiversity and productivity potential. Of course, these developments won't mean anything without availability, accessibility and adoption. Our collective sustainability challenges are too big to leave any innovative tools or solutions behind and innovative products that remain on the shelf will never positively impact our food systems. The challenges before us require all available solutions, including enabling environment that facilitate open and free trade. South Africa has long been at the forefront of trade and innovation on the African continent, and it is important this community continues engaging and advocating to promote access to agricultural innovations. The threat to global food security will not disappear anytime soon. We must have the courage to challenge ourselves and our networks to champion new innovations and new partnerships and to ensure equitable access to these critical technologies and inputs that move us forward sustainable food systems. I wish you every success with your important discussion and I hope to see you very soon in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Julia, for that um, insightful presentation. I think Julia mentions a couple of uh, points in there, and at the core of it is the fact that as the world, we are in a place where population is rising and people have to be fed. And at the same time, we have uh, challenges around pests and diseases, uh, particularly as the Af continent of Africa, and climate change continues also to present a couple of risks. And I think the core at the, uh, of it uh, there is the fact that how do we manage all of those pests uh, aside and what can we use, what sort of new innovations that can come about uh, from institutions or members like the Crop Life Swan. And at the core of it also we have to think deeply about productivity. And I think productivity is what has enabled South Africa, as I said in the opening, to be at a place where we are at this point. And I mean, if you look at a couple of indexes like the food security index, you'll find that South Africa is the most food secure country in the sub-Saharan African continent. And at the core of it is, of course, the points um, that have been raised around innovation and the stuff. So we're gonna move now quickly to Laurie Goodwill. Laurie Goodwin is also the vice president uh, for public affairs Affairs and Communication at Crop Life International. Laurie is going to offer us useful insights um, in the context with some of the key issues that are emerging, the Green Deal in the EU, very important for South African exporters, and also to some extent uh, look briefly on what's going on in the Black Sea and innovation in the complex of that. So Laurie will give us insight on that. She's joining us also virtually from the EU, from the US uh, in Washington, DC. If at the time as she's speaking, you can just jot down any questions as 
as you've done with Julia and send them through at the end of all of this because we'll still have a panel discussion on that. If you can bring up Laurie's presentation, please. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you very much for the opportunity to be a part of this panel and for the chance to address an important topic, how public policy can support or create barriers for innovation. My name is Lori Goodwin and I am the Vice President of Public Affairs and Communications at CropLife International based in Washington, DC. I'm pleased to see this topic on your agenda as it is one that is very important to us here at CropLife International. We just heard from Julia about how innovation is critical and important to agriculture. And was also mentioned, it is not enough that these innovations exist. They cannot positively impact or accelerate our transition to sustainable food systems without commercialization. Equal access to technology is a core value for us at CropLife International, and one I know that is supported by all of you. Whether we are talking about the technologies we represent or other food systems innovations, it is not enough to just support research and development through public policy. We also need to foster a policy environment that supports getting these innovations into the hands of farmers. And we know these types of public policies which support innovation and equal access can have significant and positive impact on productivity. If we take South Africa, for example, as early adopters of plant biotechnology, you saw an estimated $5 million in ecosystem benefits between 2001 and 2018 as a result of GM white maize, according to a 2021 peer-reviewed study in the Journal of Global Food Security. And the same study estimated the total welfare benefits attributable to GM white maize for the same time period at almost $695 million. And while the transition to more sustainable food systems is at the center of many global, regional, and country policies, these transitions cannot compromise food security. The two topics are inextricably intertwined. And while we can and must accelerate our transition to sustainable food systems, it cannot come at the expense of achieving our ambition of zero hunger. At the heart of most of these policies, the ambitions are the same, to provide nutritious food for a growing population while allowing farmers to maintain and increase productivity while reducing emissions, halting biodiversity loss, and improving rural community livelihoods. Where these product policies frequently differ is in the prescriptive nature of how to achieve the objectives. Although right now the global conversation has rightly shifted to food security as a result of war in Ukraine, the intersection of biodiversity and climate and its subsequent impact cannot and should not be underestimated. The ongoing crisis in Ukraine is putting food security and food sovereignty at the front and center of all policy discussions. And I believe that these global conversations will be viewed through a food security lens throughout 2022. If we simply look at the Russian and, U and Ukrainian share in global markets of cereals, it is impossible to imagine a world where this crisis does not have a long lasting impact on global food security. Conversations around sustainable food systems are not easy, and we must consider trade-offs and policy consequences in our discussions and decision-making. Benefits in one policy area or one part of the world must not be canceled out by losses elsewhere. Russia and Ukraine are among the top five exporters of cereals globally, and prices of cereals will jump in March, having risen by 3% month-on-month and almost 15% year-on-year, according to the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. This is expected to have a meaningful and long-term impact on food security in Africa, especially North Africa, and I'm sure here in South Africa, specifically where you can see about 35% of wheat imports are dependent on Russia or Ukraine. Long-term impacts on fertilizer and energy inputs will only be understood in the coming months and years, but have definitely created uncertainty and triggered policy implementation to limit exports of crop inputs and commodities. Food sovereignty discussions are on the rise, and we have seen some countries institute these types of policies in recent days. However, open, fair, and resilient global trade is key to supporting international markets and to keeping supply chains moving, a sentiment that has been shared by the G7 agricultural ministers and the FAO. In the face of, global, of current global crises, farmers need more tools available to increase their productivity to meet global nutrition demands, 
while mitigating and adapting to climate change. Supporting plant science technologies via evidence-based decision-making and reducing or eliminating non-tariff trade barriers by enforcing international rules and trading standards is more important than ever before. Together, we need to continue to amplify the message of the contribution to food security and, food su and sustainability that plant science technologies like pesticides and GM crops offer. The global conversation has shifted in recent years to recognize the interconnectivity between biodiversity, climate, and food. This was on display at last year's COP26 climate conference in Scotland and at the United Nations Food System Summit, where for the first time we saw a true global multi-stakeholder discussion on food systems and systems-based approaches to agricultural sustainability. Historically, these types of discussions tended to happen in silos, often with agriculture ministries talking to each other without contact with their environment ministry counterparts where we used to have the public and private sectors having siloed discussions about addressing agriculture challenges and the importance of sustainability. And so although there were no new negotiations or conventions arising from the Food System Summit, it was the first time that stakeholders from across the world, the value chain, including member states, came together to participate in meaningful and inclusive discussions to identify challenges and solutions to the world's most pressing issue how to feed a growing population nutritious food within the planetary boundaries. And it did result in several momentous coalitions being formed and launched, including the Coalition on Sustainable Productivity Growth for Food Security and Resource Conservation, or as it's a more affectionately known, the SPG Coalition, which will focus on accelerating the transition to more sustainable food systems through agricultural productivity growth that optimizes sustainability across three pillars, social, environmental, and most importantly for farmers, economic. Many countries have joined, including export countries like the US, Australia, Brazil, Canada, but there are also import countries like, uh, like Vietnam participating and uh, closer to home for all of you, Ghana, and then from the Middle East, Israel, and Jordan. So it is an interesting cross-section of member states that don't typically have a way to convene together to discuss these important topics. Since it's a multi-stakeholder coalition, uh, the UN FAO is also involved, as are academic re and research institutions like IFPRI, and of course, us as CropLife International are also members, as well as several of our members, Bayer, Corteva, FMC, Syngenta, Bio, and CropLife America. There will be opportunities to support the coalition through the global CropLife network, including here in the continent and via CropLife South Africa, as this group offers an alternative approach to food system sustainability based on productivity, not a prescriptive approach like the one laid out in other public policies like the EU Green Deal. As I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, this transition to more sustainable food systems is at the center of many new global, regional and country policies. And perhaps the most well-known glo globally is the EU Green Deal, which is made up of numerous strategies, including the farm to fork, and presents a prescriptive approach to achieving food system sustainability, including reduction targets and proposes imp imposing environmental trade criteria and mirror clauses on imports. Although the EU Green Deal is having an outsized influence in these conversations internationally, other countries are putting forward alternative policy positions on how and why their agriculture sector is also sustainable. Globally, there is alignment around the ambitions of these policies, which are geared towards accelerating the transition to more sustainable food systems while maintaining or increasing production of nutritious food. At CropLife International, we also support these ambitions and actions to address climate change, improve and protect biodiversity and increase food security. However, we also believe that there are many types of food systems that can deliver sustainable agriculture and that there is no need for the prescriptive approach put forward in farm to fork and Green Deal policy. Benefits in one policy area or part of the world must not be canceled out by losses elsewhere. And in our advocacy, we urge the EU to consider all factors that impact biodiversity, land use, food security and climate change in their policy approach and to move away from the more prescriptive approach they have currently put forward. I'll leave it to my colleague Samira to discuss in more detail the potential impact the EU Green Deal could have in Africa, 
But I will note that the influence on non-EU countries is being supported through persuasion and green diplomacy in global conversations and forums where the EU positions itself as the, and the Green Deal as the standard for food system sustainability. At the end of the day, the EU Green Deal is not yet mandatory or even approved for implementation. However, this policy does set the direction of travel for the EU and has been guiding their interventions in global conversations such as those at the Convention on Biological Diversity, at the WTO, and at the United Nations Food Systems Summit. Having said this, many of you will have noted a change in tone from many EU member states and some within the EU Commission resulting from the ongoing crisis in Ukraine and Russia. Some have been very vocal questioning the future of the Green Deal and related strategies like the farm to fork as Europe faces increasing concerns with food security and rising food prices. Some have even gone so far as to call for a halt to the implementation or even an abandonment of the strategy altogether. The future of the EU Green Deal and its implementation will ultimately be agreed upon by EU member states. CropLife International and the Global CropLife Network will remain focused on putting forward solution-based engagement and highlighting the critical role agricultural innovation and plant science technologies can make to sustainable production. As I mentioned, other countries also have strategies that share the ambition of the Green Deal. It is critical for stakeholders and decision makers to hear from other countries how their agriculture sector is also sustainable. Canada has been actively promoting Canadian agriculture as sustainable in international discussions and forums and highlighting that this has been enabled as a result of their adoption of agricultural innovation and plant science technologies. Japan has also presented its own Green Deal, which is a bit more of a domestic and a long-term agricultural plan. It's unlikely to be mandatory in nature and it doesn't intend to impose trade restrictions on imports. Australia has a very strong national soil health strategy to improve their soil health and to help farmers adapt and mitigate to the impacts of climate change through a natural national strategy that embraces agricultural innovation. And in the United States, the Biden administration remains committed and focused on climate change, adaptation and mitigation. Coalitions led by the US, including uh, the SPG, which I mentioned before, and the aim for climate provide a space for a conversation about the need for productivity and the critical nature of improving and accelerating innovation in agriculture. And for Latin America, Brazil and Argentina have adopted agricultural innovation and have had tremendous success in elevating their productivity and increasing their exports. Both countries are very vocal internationally and in international forums about the importance of plant science technologies and the resulting increase they've had in their research and development domestically and also in their increased productivity. At CropLife International, we are working with the CropLife Network colleagues to coordinate and align our messages and strategy around policies focused on accelerating food system sustainability. We're putting forward solution-focused engagement on sustainability ambitions, including how agriculture innovations can support food security, climate change, and biodiversity goals, and guiding policymakers towards a workable and enabling framework for more sustainable food systems globally, fostering a holistic review of potential negative trade-offs globally, and offering sound anchor points and advocacy opportunities for policymakers. Advocating for trade policies that support open, fair, and resilient trade systems are also critical in our activities, and challenging countries that diverge from international agreements and trade norms are also a focus. We continue to look forward to our work with you as our success at the international level is dependent on the engagement from our CropLife network and members who are actively engaged in advocacy and outreach with their governments, multilateral institutions, and of course, other key stakeholders. The proposed measures in the farm to fork strategy are not the only ways to deliver greater sustainability in agriculture. Many sustainable farming systems exist today that are delivering environmental benefits while increasing food security and making improvements to farmer livelihoods. Further innovation and technological progress in agriculture is essential for the development of more resilient and sustainable food systems. We must unlock innovation in agriculture and apply science and evidence to regulatory decision making to improve equal access to plant science technologies. 
there must be consideration for open and fair trade with respect to international rules and trading standards. Some of the proposed measures I, I mentioned as a result of the EU Green Deal would limit market access and negatively impact the ability of farmers and particularly smallholders to be competitive. And once again, benefits in one policy area or one part of the world cannot be canceled out by losses elsewhere. Of course, the challenges and opportunities faced are different in every region and country, and I look forward to learning from the other pan panelists how these global policies are creating challenges and hopefully opportunities for you here in South Africa. Laurie, thank you so very much uh, for that. Uh, very insightful. And I think we're picking up a couple of points. And I would like to, to start with the first one because you mentioning, for example, some of the gains that South Africa has seen on white maize since the adoption of the GM maize. In the hall, we have one of the prominent farmers, Mr. Derek Matthews, of, uh, president of Grain SA, who has seen that development over the years um, happening in the grain industry. So indeed, that has assisted us a, a great deal and on food security, of course. But also your point about the agricultural sustainability uh, in other countries on saying, let's not only focus what's happening in the EU, but let's learn also what other countries are, are doing in as far as ensuring that sustainability is at the core of agriculture. And I think those are some of the key points that during the discussions, many people would probably find those very useful. And I think we will dive in deeper also on some of the points you have mentioned within the Green Deal, which I think they are very important to be elevated. Again, I will remind everyone that is joining us online that if you are struggling with the website, uh, this conference is also on YouTube and you can place some of the questions there on YouTube, we'll be able to pull them up um, and bring them into discussion. We are almost now heading towards the end of the session where we will go to the panel discussion. And again, if you are in the hall, do write down some of the questions. We will come back and have a robust discussion on a couple of these issues. The next speaker now that we are going to go to is Dr. Samira Amelal, and she is CEO of Crop Life um, um, Middle East and uh, Africa region. And she's dialing in from Morocco. And she's going to be speaking um, about one of the important aspects. I think many people in South Africa, those that are in the fruit industry and in the wine industry are pretty much very interested on. That's the EU-Africa bilateral discussion and really narrowing the discussion of the Green Deal that Laurie began to speak to and give us more detail and reflections onto that. So if you can just bring up uh, Samira's uh, uh, presentation, and she is, of course, uh, live online, so keep sending those questions and keep writing down some of them. We will get to them. Thank you. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be speaking here on behalf of CropLife Africa Middle East. I would like to applaud the efforts and initiative by CropLife South Africa in coming up with this event, which be, brings together key experts to address the implications of the European Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy for Africa Middle East. It's encouraging to see that the national associations are taking a proactive and leading role in having the country voices heard in this dialogue. So please to begin my presentation, let me start underlining that as an industry, our ability to operate in the market is impacted by the policy environment we face. Policies that are fit for purpose are in our interest. That is to say, policies that enable us to bring the necessary technologies to farmers to help improve food security, empower the world's fastest growing continent to be a competitive global trade force and enable sustainable development. As an industry we face, we have followed the European Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy and contributed to the discussion between the Europe and Africa and Middle East in relation to these policies directions. And we want to help to achieve a green transition in agriculture and our member companies are committed to donated national sustainable development goals. I will be presenting to you what Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy for Africa and Middle East 
and what's needed to be done to achieve an improved sustainable agri-food relationship between the Europe and Africa and Middle East. So let me start with the Global United Nations Sustainable Development Goals that both continents are working towards. The future sustainability of agriculture is crucial and arguably more important in Africa and Middle East, given it's a key sector in our geography with a massive social and economic footprint. Globally, we have a framework that we are all working towards, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Indent, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by all United Nations member states in 2015, provides a shared blueprint for pieces, um, peace sorry, and prosperity for people and, and the planet now and into the future. And its heart are seven, the 70 Sustainable Development Goals, which are an urgent call for action by all countries developed and developing in a global partnership. Important to emphasis, Europe and Africa have varying reality, and in its short, in it's understandable that their path to achieving those goals would also be different. Regarding the European agenda, Europe is working to overcome the challenges of climate and environmental degradation through its Green Deal. Food and agriculture have specific Green Deal, which is farm to fork strategy that aims to make food system fair healthy and environmentally friendly. Moreover, the African Union has its Agenda 2063, which is a strategic framework that sets its aspiration for a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development. The Comprehensive African Agriculture Development Program, one of the frameworks under Agenda 2063, aims to help African countries eliminate hunger and reduce poverty by raising economic growth through agricultural lead development as well as promoting increased national budget provision for the agricultural sector. However, Europe is far more food secure than Africa and Middle East. Home more than 50% of the world's population face it food insecurity. Europe also is not faced best diseases, pressure like fall army warm and desert locusts that are causing an increasing risk to food security and the livelihood of over 300 million people in Africa. Europe also is not growing crop like cocoa and coffee and are not vulnerable to climate change. Let's be move on to what Europe is proposing in its Green Deal and Farm to Fork strategy and what this means for Africa and Middle East. In May 2020, the European Communication, a Farm to Fork strategy for a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system was published. And it's a huge and wide European initiative that will have many impacts across Africa over the coming years. So here in the slide, I um, is mentioning the impact of 50% reduction of overuse and risk of pesticide and 50% reduction of the use of more hazard pesticide, meeting cut off criteria or candidate for substitution. Also at least 21st 25% of land dedicated to organic agriculture by 2030, and also at least 10% of agriculture land should be brought back under high diversity landscape future. The implication of the European Green Deal and farm to fork strategy for Europe relations with Africa are access to Europe market is made conditional to food being produced without the use of input not authorize, authorized for use in, in Europe under mirror clauses. As you know, France is currently holding the presidency of the Council of the Europe and pushing for mirror clauses. Recently, French President Emmanuel Macron has described this idea as a common sense way of using policies, mentioning that our own constraints reflected back to us by the people with whom we trade. So also, and currently, uh, the current European consultation ended on 16 March, calling for evidence on application for Europe health and environmental, environment standard to import agriculture and agri-food products. French Agriculture Minister Julian, uh, <clears throat> 
French agriculture minister noted he would like to see moral clauses. He has been reported as waiting to piggyback on a planned overhaul of the Europe's agrochemical legislation to demand strict maxim maximum pesticide residue in food imports. There is also a question mark as to what it could mean for technology produced in Europe that are exported for farmers in Africa, Middle East, and the rest of the world use. So I touched already on some of the varying reality between Africa and Middle East. A green transition in Africa requires a different approach to that of the European's Green Deal. Indeed, policies suited to the needs of the one continent will not necessarily be suited to the other. Africa is more vulnerable to the impact of climate change and its farmers face pest and disease pressure that European farmers do not. Access to the necessary technologies plays a key role for livelihood and improved food security on the continent. Their proper control and responsible use remain a joint public and private sector priority. Moving to the next slide, I would emphasize it that Africa and Europe renewed and deepened their partnership in February of this year at 6th African Union European Union Summit, where they set a joint vision for 2030. The Europe did not find a receptive audience in the African ministry to using the Green Deal as framework. Instead, the UN Paris Agreement was used as a reference point. Team Europe Europe put, effort, put forward an investment package in sustainable food system to accelerate the sustainable transformation of African food system in support of Africa's agriculture, fisheries, and food development agenda. It aims to support efforts at first creating a transparent policy environment for private investment, second, enhancing the investment in support to agri-food and fish processing, and third, facilitating, facilitating innovation and boosting improved nutrition. The private sector was also involved in the lead up to the summit through the European Africa Business Forum, which we as Crop Life AME were formally part of, of it. And we also helped it draft the business declaration input relating to agri-food system. You will see in the declaration the reference to the importance of improved trade relationship, including addressing non-tariff barriers. It's also underlining the importance role of private sector. If the Europe does introduce MARA clauses, then arguably it will not be it will not be violating the international trading standard, but it will also be going against the essence of the Europe Africa Business Declaration and Africa Europe Partnership Agreement. So I will now you go over some of the Care Crop Life Africa Middle East recommendation. We have also submitted this to the Europe's call for evidence on the import of agriculture and food products applying Europe health and environmental standard. First, Crop Life Africa Middle East member companies are adopting and committing to measurable sustainable agriculture practice to mitigate the impact of climate change, ensure food security and keep food affordable. These practices include training in the secure and correct use and storage of pesticide, pesticide as well as the implementation of the integrated pest management strategy. It's also imperative that access to local language label and protective equipment be strengthened. Second, a transition toward a circular economy and national program for responsible management of waste is crucial. The plant science industry globally and in Africa Middle East has developed a stewardship initiative to responsibly manage the full life cycle of products such as the empty container management program. And the program led by CropLy South Africa members is the best evidence of our industry commitment. Third, data-driven decision-making and outcome-based goals should be the foundation of progress in sustainable agriculture. Fourth, a science evidence evaluation and impact assessment should be conducted on all policies affected agri-food production and trade between Europe and African nation, taking in, into account all pillars of the sustainable development goals. 
five, tackling the circulation of illegal and counterfeit inputs and products must may remain a priority and collective responsibility. We call for an operation super, similar to the Operation Silver Axe, as supported by Europol, should be introduced. So as a highlight on the last slide, why is proud of the work we have done with CropLife Africa Middle East on the Africa-Europe Partnership and Green Deal Dialogue. We recognize that to have a real impact, we need to do more. And by we, I mean all of us here in Africa, we need to step up and we need to do it soon. In many ways, this is a call to action to make a difference and stand ready as partner to support the implementation of a localized green transition in Africa. We Crop Life Africa Middle East, we are here to support and build capacity of the region to understand the different dynamism and impact of Europe and global policies in respective countries towards a sustainable agriculture in our continents. So I hope my presentation and the call for us all to step up has been clear and I look forward to answering any question you might have. Thank you very much. Samari, your call for us all to stand together has been indeed very clear and we appreciate all of those insights. I think you've deepened the understanding of many people of the EU Green Deal, uh, what it entails, how should we be thinking about it um, as Africans, as South Africa, uh, both in learning uh, and also in preparing ourselves for trading with the EU. But I think you've also nicely highlighted some of the trade-offs that we need to consider, less chemicals in a continent where there's a lot of pests um, and also a continent that still needs to do a lot to improve its yields on the crops. So you've given us a lot onto that. And I think there will be deeper conversation around policy, particularly with some of the recommendations that from a crop life side you have made. But I'm not going to delve into those because we are now approaching the discussion and we have just one last speaker. And I think everyone that is in the hall, if you continue making your comments, if you are watching online on YouTube, put down those comments and the questions there. We are now closer to, to that. The last speaker that we're having is uh, a person that I think many people in South Africa are familiar with. He has spent many years working for this sector, is uh, Mr. Corpus Hardman. Uh, he's joining us uh, from Cape Town. He's listening. He has done a pre-recording presentation. Uh, Cobus is with the Agribusiness uh, System International, and he'll really take us through the potential impact of trade from South Africa, again reflecting to an extent on all of these developments that are happening um, in the EU and some challenges that we do face um, in South Africa. So if you can bring up Kubas's presentation so long and then right after him, we will be heading for the panel discussion. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kubas Hartman. I have been the technical manager for a, a local distributing company for many years. I've also been the, uh, the market access manager for a larger fruit export company for many years. And I'm now in a stage of early retirement and uh, still work as an independent consultant amongst fruit trade, specifically focusing on market access. I was requested to look at the impact of international market standards on South African fresh produce trade, and I've taken a little bit of poetic freedom to um, and, and changed the, uh, the subject slightly. But let's look at, at the detail. Um, the South African fruit trade or the South African agricultural exports derives a huge amount of foreign exchange from processed and unpro unprocessed agricultural exports on an annual basis. We have trading partners across the globe, but we are mainly focused on EU or the, U the EU, UK, and um, to some extent, United States, Canada, far and Middle East. 
During 2019, we derived a net income of approximately 44,000 million rand from unprocessed agricultural product and in the vicinity of 7,000 million rand from processed agricultural produce. This is a graph that was obtained from the National Marketing Council and that was published in 2020, indicating the balance of payment between processed, uh, the balance of payment for unprocessed agricultural produce. And there you can clearly see the uh, 44 plus thousand million rand earned as a balance of payment, net balance of payment. And this is a, um, this is the graph for the unprocessed agricultural produce exports, slightly less than in the case of the, uh, of the unprocessed produce. We are part of a global market and we are thus guided by international market rules. I often get the question whether other countries are set, subjected to the same rules as we are. Now, needless to say, we are subjected to all of these, especially if you play in this global arena. All our trading partners have similar rules, some slightly more draconic than others. Uh, some focuses more on phytosanitary issues. Some focus put their focus on, on uh, agricultural remedy issues, some on both. But inevitably, we are guided by the rules of our trading partners. Everybody exporting to another country or group of countries or conglomerate of countries like the EU needs to comply with these rules. And we are not unique and not excluded as the only ones that have to do that. All growers, irrespective of size or status, face several challenges. We have common challenges. And in other cases, we also have to endure agricultural specific challenges, specifically when it comes to the use of agricultural remedies. The common challenges are, are, uh, are in abundance, things like socioeconomic challenges, resource challenges like electricity, that has almost become an ex extinct commodity, water, labor, inputs such as finances, and um, the climate and weather. All of those are, uh, are governing, to a large extent, our business in agriculture. Then, of course, we also have to endure ever-tightening international clampdowns on crop protection compounds. This is something that has come to the fore over the last number of years, most probably a decade or so, and is really slowly but surely causing major problems in production and our competitability, our competitivity internationally. We are seeing a diminishing in crop protection compounds, and this in itself is threatening to diminish the quality of our produce and our ability to compete internationally, as we've already said. If we do not comply, we could see our earnings from international trade dwindling, we could see more and more dependence on the net importation of produce because we cannot compete, we cannot get our produce sold, and therefore we have to become more and more reliable on imported produce. And it makes it, as it is at the moment, very difficult for large enterprises to compete internationally. It also makes it more difficult for small and developing farmers to join the international trade. And that in itself is a huge problem, especially if we look at the amount of money spent on the upliftment, development and transformation of these young and new upcoming farmers. From the 620 million Rand plus minus that we've collected uh, uh, last year as a statutory levy, in the vicinity of 45% have been spent on transformation and the, and the development of upcoming farmers. And this whole exercise could become futile if these people cannot share in the, actual, in the international market access. The effect of international trade rules, this affects the international trade rules on the South African fresh produce trade. And it will not burden, well, that is the team. 
I'm sorry, this is the team that I would like to address in the, in the discussion is that the effect of international trade rules on South African fresh produce, we will have to discuss, we will discuss that further. I will obviously not burden you with a myriad of standards surrounding the uh, SPS regulations. SPS is the acronym standing for sanitary and phytosanitary regulations and requirements. But I will focus on the effect of these international trade, the rules and the regulation pertaining to crop protection, which I just abbreviated by calling it CPCs, and how these rules affect our international trade and our ability to compete internationally. Over the last years or over the last almost decade or more, the international trade environment changed dramatically. Since the conception of the EU, which was about 40 years ago, 40 plus years ago, in the early 1990s, there was only seven member states. And it was difficult as it was to export to these seven member states because of the fact that each and every one of them had its own set of rules. But in the early 1990s, 1991 in particular, they promulgated a regulation called Regulation 414 of 1991, which attempted to harmonize the individual or the different trading partners in the EU, the residue standards for these different trading partners. And of course, if that was successful at the time, it would have alleviated a lot of pressure from international exporters into the EU, whilst you have not, you, you didn't have to comply with everyone's individual standard, you could comply with one standard and it would fit everyone concerned. However, it was not very successful. New enforcement rules came about in 2005 and further amendments to these enforcement rules came about in 2009. And it was in particularly these 2009 amendments that was introduced that changed the so-called cutoff criteria for registration of crop protection compounds in the EU. And with these new cutoff criteria or the new standards, they moved from a hazard or from a risk-based environment to a hazard-based environment. The regulators in the EU determined that it was no longer sensible to judge a chemical or to judge a crop protection compound only on its ability only on its risk, in other words, the, the uh, combination of hazard times exposure, but, but only on hazard. And they said if a product is hazardous, it, is a, it already flags a red light, and we have to be very careful if we register such products or if we re-register them when they came to the end of the useful life cycle in Europe. This led to a whole new ball game, and they said we cannot classify each and every product as uh, under hazardous, but we have to look at groups of products. And they said you cannot register a compound or it would become very difficult to register a compound in the EU if it is regarded as a serious carcinogen. In other words, if it is regarded as a, as a potential cancer developing or cancer inducing compound if it is regarded as a mutagenic substance, in other words, could cause mutations, if it was regarded as a reproductive toxin, or if it was regarded as a persistent organopollutant, and that has a very wide implication. And then, of course, they also added the so-called ill-defined endocrine disruptors. The endocrine disruptors there are many compounds that could be regarded as endocrine disruptors, and it was very difficult to distinguish which ones are more serious than others. Well, it led to an array of cancellations. Just about all organophosphates at the present moment have seen the cancellation of their registrations in Europe. This includes compounds, well-known old compounds like azenphosmethyl, chlorpyrifos, the whole group of the dithiocarbamates, of which mancozeb is most probably the most prominent one, the dicarboxamates <clears throat> with the old botrytocytes like rovarol, sumisclex, fell by the wayside. Many of the new nicotinoids was classified as unacceptable due to its environmental impact and effect on bees in particular. 
about all the traditional nematocytes that we knew, like Aldicarp, Phenomifos, Caducifos, all of those have lost the international registration. Endosulfan, DNUC, which was a very important rest-breaking or dormancy-breaking compound in the Western Cape or in the deciduous fruit environment, was seriously affected. Benomil, which is still around in South Africa, lost its international registration for many reasons. And then, of course, many of the synthetic pyrethroids, the carbamates, paraquat, all of them have seen the demise under this new hazard base cutoff criteria that was laid down by the EU. Okay, the obvious question is, why don't we just develop new compounds? Why don't, can't we just get into the market, get our researchers, get our bio biologists to develop new compounds for the South African market if we lost the old ones? Unfortunately, it is not so easy. The South African crop protection market, which is to generate the return on investment for these development costs, is a fraction of the international market. We are no more than between one and one and a half percent of the international trade. And if something in particular needs to be registered for South Africa, I do not think it will solicit the attention of many of the international and multinational companies. South Africa, in any case, spends a fraction of its GDP on R&D, and it has become a problem to, to get funds to, or to, to fund uh, research on the level needed for the replacement of crop protection compounds. All of this means that we will simply have to do more with less. This is a graph that I've obtained from uh, UNESCO, and this was again published in 2021, but it was, up, it was updated until 2018. And this gives an indication of the development ex expanded or expenditure as a percentage of GDP for various countries. South Africa has been included amongst a number of the developed countries and you can see the South African performance on the lowest line at the bottom, the brown line at the bottom, where you can clearly see that since 2013 and 2017, we have not came, we didn't come near to spending more than 1% of our GDP on research and development. And this includes all research and development, not only research and development for agriculture. If you compare that to a country like China, which is the next graph above that one, you see that Chinese uh, R&D expenditure moved dramatically in the right direction. And since 20, or since 1996, the Chinese expenditure as a percentage of GDP moved from 0.5% to just over 2%. If you consider that China is the second largest economy in the world, sometimes just super, superseded by Japan, incidentally, you can see that it is a huge economy with a huge percentage and therefore a lot of money be spent on R&D. Then, of course, the, uh, the star of the day is, is, the, um, is the United States, where you can see that they spend in the vicinity of about 3.75% of the GDP in 2017 on R&D. So yes, these other countries can afford it. We can hardly scratch the bottom with what we have available. Are we the only ones that are affected by these international standards? I've asked the question before, and the answer is still the same. No, all international exporters are affected. But there's light in the tunnel. South Africa is a little bit better off than our international trading partners. In many instances, we still have some of these compounds that have been banned in the EU registered in South Africa. We can therefore still legitimately use them. And in many cases, the EU has allowed import tolerances for products that are no more in existence in the EU. In other words, if we have a residue on our fruit or, 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 or export produce, we can still enter the market and we can still sell, sell internationally. 
even though those products have been banned in the country of destination. Of course, this creates tension amongst our grower partners in, north, in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, they don't like the fact that they are being restricted by the absence of certain compounds, and uh, they would like to see much more harmonization right across the globe when it comes to these export compounds or export use of, of crop protection compounds. In many cases, we have seen grower or consumer groups like NGOs such as Greenpeace, Friends of the Earth, PAN, and others that act as watchdogs over the actions of the authorities and retailers, that they are reacting against the use of certain unacceptable or unwanted crop protection compounds. They are remandated or they take their mandate from a large or significant portion of consumers and in the end of the day, they act on behalf of these consumers when they speak to regulators and crop protection companies across the globe. They play a crucial role in influencing the authorities and the retailers, who in many cases are very concerned about the, the opinion of these NGOs to reduce the impact of hazardous crop protection products across the globe. And they argue that there is absolutely no value in having restrictions on an undesirable CPC in the EU, but not having it elsewhere, which I think is quite logic. Further compliance standards are therefore introduced by the trade. And in many cases, and may I say this with my tongue in my cheek, I am not so convinced that the trade would have done this out of own initiative, if it was not for the pressure exerted by the NGOs on the use of uh, crop protection compounds. Okay. Let's see if there's any justification for these decisions. In my personal opinion, I think yes. I have there are vulnerable groups like uh, children, the elderly, immune compromised individuals that are exposed to hazardous chemicals and that are more affected by hazardous compounds than the run of the mill individual out there. Over the many years that I've worked in the agrochemical trade, I have yet come across someone that have died from the legitimate use of a crop protection compound. And as such, you can argue that it is that these products are not so dangerous. Yes, there is an element of truth in there, but remember that everyone that are exposed to fresh produce are also exposed to the residues of agrochemical compounds. Hence, the flourish of the so-called organic production. But that in itself is a story for another day. However, the consumer community have to some extent lost confidence in the safety and the, le and the legitimate use of agrochemicals. And we can see that through the uprise of production standards such as Global Gap, Tesco Nurtures and many others that have come to the fore mainly because consumers are arguing that they do not trust those that hang, handle our agrochemicals in general, and therefore want to see audits, want to see standards, want to see a new approach to chemicals, which have led to many of these, maybe sometimes rather draconic standards that we are seeing. So what does the future entail? I think we will see fewer CPCs to work with in the future. That would mean our toolbox of control agents will shrink. And there are some uh, speculation that we might lose a further 30% of the existing active ingredients over the next 10 years due to these regulations coming to the fore. It also, it, it also entails that we will not see 
very much replacements for this 30% because of the, cross, uh, the cost and the length of R&D. We will also see an expansion of the diversity in the various standards set by retailers. As the retail community becomes more and more stricter, we see more and more standards being designed and enforced by the retail and by these consumer groups. So the diversity, the complexity of compliance largely increases. This to a large extent will negate the efforts to harmonize the rules of compliance among various importing countries, especially in the EU, making it much more difficult and in many cases much more expensive to comply. We will see an increase in the cost of registration trials and the cost of compliance, as I've already said, under the so-called Global Harmonization Initiative. Remember what I said about the pressure from international growers which say that they cannot, they would not like, they don't like to endure the fact that they are being limited to use certain agrochemicals, not use certain agrochemicals, but their trading partners and their production partners overseas are allowed to use that. There is a global harmonization initiative that's being rolled out from uh, the international regulators into many of the other participating countries, such as South Africa. And they are being pressure being applied to the regulators to cancel the registration of these unwanted products, whether it's uh, a necessary product or not in South Africa. And the latest one that fell prey to that was the much used chlorpyrifos in South Africa. We also need more intelligent positioning of existing and older compounds. Many of the older compounds have, are not obsolete. They are still very useful, often being overshadowed by new compounds with, with uh, new attributes. But many of these old compounds, if you look at the registration trials, you can see that they perform as well as the new compounds, if in many cases not better, but they house attributes which we can still use and utilize to fill gaps left by the ones that have been cancelled before them. We also see, we will see an increase in resistant development against certain existing compounds due to the overuse of certain CPCs. And we have to be very careful that we apply IPM rules properly which in the end of the, day, end of the day becomes more and more difficult with reduced toolbox. We also will see a biological uh, increase in the registrations of biological crop protection compounds. We already see that a large number of these biologicals are entering the trade, and uh, but there's a little bit of, of caution that I have that we have to apply. Normally, and not in all cases, but normally these compounds work best when supported by synthetic chemistry. And they should not, in many cases, be used as standalone compounds. May I say this with hesitance? They always, they often work much better when the pest and all, or the disease are not present. There is some biological products that have huge merit but you have to consider the cost benefit against the price tag, especially when it comes to robustness. Can they withstand long intervals of application or must they be uh, applied more regularly or must they be applied under very special conditions? Unfortunately, like in many cases, we cannot move forward in this new arena if we do not have the support of the regulator in South Africa we will have to revisit the rules of registrations of new and existing compounds. The regulator is, in any country is supposed to be an enabler of agriculture. And at the present moment, and I say this with due respect, I see very little of that in South Africa. We certainly cannot wait three to four years for a new registration to be granted. By the time the registration gets into the market, the compound might have loose, lo lost its, its prevalence and became obsolete. 
This is testimony, unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, this is testimony of a broken system that requires urgent correction. Otherwise, it will cost our country and in many cases, upcoming growers dearly. I would like to conclude. We have to raise the bar for qualifications and control of crop protection practitioners. This is a profession worthy of professionals and we cannot allow just anyone to sell, recommend and prescribe agrochemicals, especially not as the international trade becomes more and more stringent. We have to focus on offering of solutions rather than selling chemicals. Otherwise, we will not be able to keep our agriculture running. Maybe it is time that we consider the same rules that apply for medical professions. You certainly should not diagnose and prescribe from the sales desk. I'm almost finished. And I conclude by saying, who knows what the future will bring? One fact that is identified and that has labeled the South African agriculture is that we were always able to find a way to survive. Compliance will be challenging, but not obliterative. Use of crop protection products need not be risky, provided that we apply the necessary caution and of course diligence. How safe do you really want these compounds to be? I thank you very much. Kobas, you were very generous with your insights and touched a number of aspects uh, from the EU side and uh, taking us back here at home. And I think your wealth of experience uh, and many years of service is clear from the insights that you have given us, uh, the evolution of regulations uh, from the early 2000s and to the <coughs> challenges that we are facing now. And I think the points you are raising about South Africa's uh, uh, low levels of investments on research is a troubling one and the most important issue to tackle. And I think also the, the aspects about the slow registration of certain agrochemicals um, is one of the key issues where I hope that some of our colleagues from government that are probably sitting online, um, they will see this from some of the remarks that you, you have made. And I think now speaking from a domestic um, perspective, there tends to be a temptation to see agriculture from an output perspective where we are enjoying the exports, enjoying uh, the produce that we do get. But I think oftentimes we overlook just the importance of all of the inputs that are necessary to giving us that final number that we tend to look at as export earnings or GDP or jobs. And I think we, we, te we need to invest a lot in that um, in South Africa. So thank you for those, Kubas. We are now um, getting on into our panel discussion whereby all of the speakers are joining us on stage and really welcome to all of you. We appreciate the insights that you have given us um, uh, this morning. And I would say my key takeaway uh, from, from all of this session is really around um, the, the sustainability issue within agriculture. A number of challenges that have been highlighted from geopolitics to new regulations to climate change, but the core question is to say, how does agriculture continue to thrive in that environment? And the risks that are presented by the climate change and many other aspects, how do then the agrochemicals industries also assist us in that, uh, in, in, in that quest to pretty much uh, achieve sustainability? But at the same time, for countries like South Africa, we also have a triple challenge of uh, unemployment, inequality, slow economic growth, and agriculture has to play part onto that. And I think for agriculture to be able to respond to those needs, it has to be a sector that is growing, that is having access to all of the agrochemicals that we do need for farmers to perform all of the duties that they can do on their side. 
And I think also, as I said at the beginning, we are an export oriented uh, agricultural sector. And what comes out of the EU is very important from a South Africa side. EU, for example, makes up about 27% of our agricultural export markets. So if you are facing some difficulties there in an export oriented agricultural sector, you are pretty much really in a tough position. So I think the inputs that we received from Lori, Samari uh, around the EU Green Deal were very helpful. But of course, I think as we move towards the discussion, the core thing is about are those really gonna remain the way they are with the pressures that are coming out of the current geopolitics? Um, and also the African countries, uh, are they going to uh, take those standards uh, and adopt them as they are, or there's going to be deeper conversations uh, around this issue. And I think those are a number of things that we will be discussing um, as we progress um, uh, with, this, with, the, with this session. And I also picked up uh, the, the key inputs about uh, farmer associations, governments coming together, learning what other countries are doing in as far as the sustainability, and then saying, how do we, um, uh, uh, this can also influence the debate in about the Green Deal um, as we go forward. Because in my perspective, I, I do think, and also just learning from what was being presented, there's a lot of regulatory risks, uh, there's a lot of compliance costs, and those that are in the horticultural sector in South Africa, particularly citrus, they already know the millions that they, they pay for some compliances uh, in the EU and the other markets. So these are all uh, key issues that I think they raising um, uh, input cost of doing business in agriculture. But uh, let me not speak um, uh, much. Let me quickly move on to the discussion. But before I open up um, uh, the floor for everyone that is in the auditorium and some questions that we have made, perhaps, uh, Rod, I could give you a, a, a minute or so to reflect on what you have learned uh, from our uh, eminent panel of about four speakers this morning. Thanks, Wandili. Um, I was very interested with, with um, uh, Julia's, uh, Laurie's, and Samira's presentations. When we first started talking about this conference, the EU Green Deal was, was top of the pops. We had a session here with, with Agbiz last year talking about strategies, where should Agbiz be looking at risks for agriculture into 2022, and the EU Green Deal kept coming up. So the, the presentations this morning, particularly Laurie's, which says the, um, the EU Green Deal is, is not yet enforced, it's not yet mandatory. It hasn't even been approved for implementation. And with what's going on in, uh, in Ukraine now, um, some countries even rethinking, uh, is, is the EU Green Deal such a good deal? So I find that quite encouraging for us because uh, we heard from Samira the huge amount of work that uh, CropLife Africa Middle East has been putting into um, trying to get mitigation uh, into the EU Green Deal for Africa. So um, if we are going to have some delays in the EU Green Deal, um, if we are going to have some of them disappearing altogether, that gives Africa a chance to, to go back and, and plead our case. And we've got lots of cases to plead. Uh, you've heard from Corbis, it is not only the normal regulators in Europe, but we have the secondary regulators, the supermarkets, the buyers. And they're all putting in additional restrictions uh, on what products can be used on our produce. Um, so those secondary regulators, as Quibus indicated, are also gaining prominence, prominence and giving us uh, more and more difficulties. Uh, we cannot have any discussion on our industry today without uh, revisiting what Quibus said about our regulatory environment. Uh, it is a huge part of CropLife South Africa's daily efforts, is uh, trying to find out how we're going to clear the backlog. How are we going to get a new system in place so that we can bring the new technologies and the new innovations we've, we've heard from our CropLife International uh, colleagues? We're not going to bring those new technologies to market unless our regulatory process in this country has a fundamental change going forward. So those will remain uh, a key focus of, of CropLife South Africa going forward. So it's a, like we keep talking about integrated pest management, uh, one daily, it's, uh, it's going to be integrated processes for us going forward. We have to look at the local regulatory environment. We have to interact with all of our members. We have to look at uh, our trading partners and the restrictions they're going to continue to put in front of us, uh, and as well as uh, the secondary regulators. So we can't deal with each one in isolation. Uh, we've, got to, we've got to look at them all in an integrated fashion. 
That, that, thanks so much, uh, uh, Rod, for, for, for that. We, we have a lot of crop life partners that are in the hall with us. So by just a show of hand, uh, if you have a question, we will really come to you. There's a mic that is roaming around, which is going to assist on that. But as we try to recognize the hands um, in the hall, I want to just go uh, to our panelists that are joining us um, uh, in there a and really start with you, Julia. You, you gave us great insights on innovation, uh, some bit of changes that are happening in, the, in global agriculture. But I want to bring you into this uh, Green Deal issue. Given the geopolitics that have been happening now, uh, uh, Julia, are you getting a sense that farmers are fully uh, involved in the discussion about the, how the EU regulators are thinking and what sentiment are you also getting from the farmers' perspective, the EU farmers, um, when you speak uh, with them uh, on that side? Julia, if you, if you could just comment for us on that, we'll really be grateful. <laughs> Thanks, thanks for a great question. And thanks, uh, thanks to CropLife uh, South Africa for having me. Thanks, Rod. Um, so it's great to be with you. Um, I would have been, I would have liked to be with you in person, of course. So, great question, but I wanted to say I couldn't agree more with the, what uh, Rod just said, which is echoing uh, your, your question. Um, in the sense, I mean, we heard, I just spoke with the commission yesterday and they they put on a halt at the moment the measures on the green deal but it's only a temporary pause because they are very adamant to continue and to to adopt the measures uh, um, anytime soon uh, and this is important to know because we should remind ourselves that the green deal is not the green deal as such it's what is inside the green deal the Green Deal is actually something also we share as an industry, is an is a SDG-led ambition. Uh, and it's, it's a shared vision, is how we get there that we need to constructively challenge. So I see that, as Robert, Rod said, an opportunity for our, our industry to collectively step up and show that there are alternatives route to achieve the same SDG-led ambition. So we shouldn't be trapped by the Green Deal as such, but we should take this opportunity, and perhaps this also this delay, to step up collectively and show and demonstrate alternative routes to achieve the same goals, actually to achieve better the same goals. We cannot forget that the fourth important leg of sustainability in agriculture is not all environmental, social and economic, but it's also about productivity, inclusive uh, productivity, which is the other side of innovation and sustainability. So and again, I would say it's a call for action of all of us to work together, to go together as a community, to work together with the farmers, uh, to step up and show the positive contribution that our industry can make and has to make to the, to the Green Deal in Europe, but also to other Green Deals growing in other parts of the world. So from risk into opportunities, from issues into new a new space for us, that we have now this, this momentum to, to grab and to collectively contribute with actions, with with the examples and more and more as i i wanted to share with you this partnership approach collective engagement that put us in a thought leadership path th th thank you so very much um uh, for that uh julia so i i get a sense then that julia because uh, part of me um, sitting in an export orientated uh, country like south africa when it comes to agriculture uh, my initial inclination when I when I saw the Green Deal, I, I had to think, is it is this the way of protecting the European farmers, or is it really about the environment? 
but I think you, you, you have given us something to, to, to reflect on to that, and thanks for that. And I want to bring in uh, Dr. Samira uh, on, on this point, because she spoke at length about the Africa uh, EU Green Deal uh, conversation in, in her remarks. But what, what I want to hear uh, from you, Amira, have you given us, um, Samira, a, a, a thought about the implication of the Green Deal to some of the, on agri-food from the developing world, uh, South Africa and the others. Uh, do you get a sense that Europe is thinking deeply about that, 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 that those implications, particularly from the global South in general? Uh, are, are you getting that sense? Uh, over to you, Dr. Samira. Dr. Samira is having a bit of a connection issue, um, which is currently being uh, sorted um, as we speak. I'm looking around in the hall to see if we have any hands uh, of questions that uh, we, 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 we might take. And as we continue to do that, I want to bring in uh, Laurie. Um, a, a bit about uh, some of these aspects. And Laurie, the point I want to bring uh, to you is around the geopolitics um, and the risks that is on food security uh, globally. You've mentioned the benefits, for example, that South Africa has enjoyed uh, since the adoption of the GM crops, the agrochemicals that we are currently using. But if you look across the borders in a number of African countries, there hasn't been as much enthusiasm as what we saw in South Africa. And I wonder now if you think the current geopolitics and the importance of self-sufficiency in food could change the sentiment in a number of countries about how do they think about agrochemicals, GMO seeds, and in general. Yeah, thank you very much. And good morning to everybody. Um, I will share Julia's sentiment that I wish we were there in person, but uh, this, this is good as well. Um, to your question, I think that uh, when something happens, like we've seen recently with the war in Ukraine, it, it changes the policy discussions all over the world. Um, I, I think that, you know, to your question, will that adopt, uh, will more countries adopt new tools? I, I'd love to think so. I think it's really challenging to have um, a, a discussion that is a very, you know, one thing doesn't affect the other. And that's true of all policies as they're implemented and impact assessments are, are very, very important. And we've seen a lot of uh, consequences of policy decisions that have had unintended consequences. And I, I, I think, you know, Africa, if we think about Sri Lanka, I think there's been certainly some demonstrations of that around the world. So while I think people are having these conversations, what I hope they are also thinking about are the consequences of um, knee-jerk type reactions to uh, some of this geopolitical events. And we've seen a lot of call for um, open and fair and resilient trade. Um, to Julia's point around productivity, maintaining farmer productivity. And I do think this is an opportunity for us to talk more about productivity and new tools. And those aren't necessarily just the products and technologies that we support, but systems-based approaches, because one thing always affects another. And so that's why I was so encouraged to see that global conversation over the last couple of years really turning towards systems. And I think the, the point was really well made by Julia as well. There's not only one food system that's sustainable. And I think now is an opportunity for us to have countries, uh, especially the export countries, step up and show the world that their existing food systems are sustainable. Certainly there is progress that can always be made, but I think it's an opportunity to have a conversation about productivity and the importance of global productivity and open and fair trade. Th thanks so much, uh, Larry, for, for, for those points. I think your opening remarks at the start really displayed to us some of the countries at which we can uh, look at to learn some lessons about how do we think about greening agriculture and also just on a productivity side. I'm looking in the room to see if we have uh, any question. We do have one question in the room. We're going to take that and then we'll come back to Rod because he also has a question he wants to present to you as a panelist. My question, uh, probably to Laurie. Um, 
there's, there's this anomaly between developed and developing, where we see developed countries looking at food safety, developing countries looking at food, food security. So the focus is definitely different. And sustainability, there's a diff the, the, the anomaly between un environmental sustainability, but then also commercial sustainability. If the grower can't stay on the farm, the food security is, is, is being compromised. So uh, is there an acknowledgement of this dichotomy uh, where one size fits all? And Wandile also referred to that, one size fits all is, is really not applicable here. Th thank you so much for that. Uh, Laurie, to you. Thank you. Yes, that's a great question. And I do think we're seeing a growing recognition of that around the world right now. Uh, we've seen uh, the European Union join the Sustainable Productivity Growth Coalition that I mentioned that came out of the uh, outcomes of the United Nations Food Systems Summit. And so that to me is a really firm acknowledgement that Europe is having these conversations internally and also wanting to be engaged with them on the global stage around productivity. And so I, I think that, you know, while of course I can't speak for any government uh, in the world, I do think generally there has been a lot more of a conversation about the intersection of climate change, biodiversity, food security, and productivity. And none of these can be pulled out discreetly from one another. You have to have these discussions together um, with many stakeholders and also, you know, a recognition about the private sector contribution to these discussions is, I think, a little more prevalent than we have seen in recent years. And I think COP26, um, you know, the climate COP had, was, a, was an example of that, a recognition that the private sector has a really important role to play in these conversations. So overall, I hope that the conversation around the world keeps happening in terms of how do we work on all of these uh, you know, global issues together uh, with multi-stakeholder approaches and partnerships that Julia referred to in her, uh, in her answer and in her presentation, and then also making sure that productivity really stays front and center in all of these discussions as well. And economic considerations to keep farmers farming are you know, obviously key to this discussion. And something that uh, is also really important is having farmer voices at the table. And I think hearing from farmers cannot be underestimated in terms of its importance. And so, um, you know, encouraging farmers to be part of these discussions, it's not easy. It takes time away from their business. And I recognize that. But having them at the table when these policy discussions are happening is crucial because they can speak to what's actually implementable. Th thanks so much, uh, Laurie, for that. I mean, economic consideration, very important because at the end of the day, these are people that are running, are running farming businesses that needs to be sustainable. And on that theme, just before coming to Rob, back to Dr. Samira, uh, because th th this point of economic consideration links nicely with the question that I, I, I would like to present to her, which is, uh, do you get a sense that the EU, as they are thinking about some of these regulations that have been set out, there is economic consideration about uh, the impact of trade in the developing world? And indeed, you can reflect uh, from a perspective of the global south. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to, to be here. And thank you for this uh, question. Um, as an industry, we have uh, followed the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, and we have contributed to this discussion between Europe and Africa Middle East in relation to this policy dire direction. And we, um, we want to help to achieve a green transition in agriculture, and we, our member company, as Julia and Lori mentioned, are committed to the development goal. However, the, Renew the Renewed Africa-Europe uh, partnership can help to unlock the, the potential sustainability. Um, here is how the, the European Africa partnership can achieve a sustainable um, uh, transition of the Green Deal in agriculture in a way that, that can work for both continents. We um, very important that um, the, 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 we we have conduct impact assessment of 
Europe can in, in, in Africa. Parties are striving to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal, but policies that suited for to the need for one will not necessarily be suited to that of the other. So talking about limiting access to crop protection in a continent where most farmers don't use agrochemical does not resonate with the local reality. So and also very important, we must allow Africa to trade rather than being left dependent on aid. Farmers in Africa are asking for improved market access to Europe and there is concern from parties, including government from many nation worldwide about European approach to market access and adherence to international agri-food trading standard. So we encourage uh, to farmers access to for use um, of public-private partnership uh, to achieve uh, such goal, and we 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 want that the European the Europe Africa partnership uh, can offer uh, a platform both for best practice exchange and to 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 offer capacity building in training of the ground. We. The, 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 the European Green Deal or European policy uh, needs to, 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 to offer opportunity also to smallholder farmer for, uh, farmers for prosperity and for a healthy future. And uh, for that, we need to, 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 to offer to the farmers a tool, tools to be resilient and competitive in the fact of involving the challenge that they are facing. So to, to summarize, I think that uh, an impact assessment of all the European policy need to be conducted in Africa and to ensure that, the, 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 ensure that there is a sustainable mission uh, in our continent for a sustainable agriculture. Th thanks Thank so you. very much, Dr. S uh, Samari, for, for that. Really, really insightful. And I think it displays the, the depth of work that still lies ahead and the collaborations that can be done uh, for making sure that uh, we, we adapt, we appreciate the risk of climate change, but at the same time, well, there's a collective response onto that, which is cognizant. Um, of the productivity gains that needs to be protected, but also some of the other parts of the world where support is still needed and technology can assist in those productivity gains on those farming. So really useful points there. We, we appreciate that input. Rod, you had some questions uh, from our panel, for our panelists. I do. Thanks, Wandili. So I'm, I'm going to carry on with, with Laurie before I skip across to Kuba. So Laurie, first of all, we know it's rather early in the morning in Washington, D.C. So again, sincere thanks for you joining us live this morning. We all appreciate it. Um, I just want to go back quickly to, to the Green Deal. Um, we, as you know, we have the, the Chair of Plant Biotechnology here with us in CropLife South Africa. And when I first looked at some of the, the EU Green Deal um, parameters, there was quite a few points in there about uh, plant biotechnology. Um, can you give us an update on, on how the EU sees plant biotechnology? Is it, is it more acceptable these days in the European Union? Is it going to be a, a significant part of the EU Green Deal? Thanks, Laurie. Thank you. And I'm sure there's many people that would love to have the direct answer to that question. And uh, unfortunately, of course, I can't speak on behalf of the Commission or member states. I do think there's generally been more openness, especially as there's been discussions about gene editing. And I'm sure everybody has been following that news um, out of Europe. There seems to be generally, you know, a little bit more room uh, for discussion around the potential for gene editing. And I believe it was even mentioned in some of the language in the farm to fork as you know, a technology that could offer a tool for the future. Having said that, I don't know what the outcomes will be from those actual policy discussions and implementation is still a way down the road, of course. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it was interesting last week, there was uh, some movement uh, as a result of some of the challenges to get feed into the EU right now uh, around removing some of those barriers. I think it was uh, Portugal and Spain that were able to uh, derogate from some of the requirements um, around GM crops because they needed to get some um, get some imports from Argentina. So I think that, you know, possibly, I, I certainly hope so. And there does seem to be openness to new technologies and it's actually in the language of the Green Deal. I think in general, we've seen globally a little more acceptance um, or at least a little less 
um, uh, maybe acceptance is the right word, towards GM technology in general. We certainly haven't seen, at least from a global perspective, a lot of the anti-activities um, that were, were mentioned previously. We haven't seen as many or as much of that, at least certainly here in the Americas, but I think also maybe more in general. Um, I think the safety of GM foods, you know, after 30 years is uh, a pretty hard to beat. And certainly we've seen almost every single international scientific body, the FAO, come out uh, with statements about the safety of that technology. So while I know there are still pockets and still challenges, I think, you know, Africa is a good example where there's been some movement on acceptance of that technology in the last few years, which is encouraging. Um, not to say that there's complete global harmonization, which is always our goal to see that there's this very cohesive um, import um, and export uh, you know, approvals on the same timeline. Uh, but, you know, maybe someday, I hope before I retire, there'll be some type of uh, global, <laughs> global acceptance. But, you know, there's still work to be done. But I think there has been generally a little less, um, a little more acceptance over the last 10 years, uh, since I, you know, in my career, anyway, towards the technology. Thank you so much, Laurie. And, uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, we've spoken already a little bit this morning about the regulatory challenges with traditional plant protection uh, uh, solutions, but we haven't exactly the same with the, with the plant biotech. So, uh, Wandili, if I may, I'll skip across quickly to, to Corbus before we start taking any of the online questions. Um, Corbus, the, the secondary regulators in Europe, um, the, the challenges and the risks we have with um, older products being withdrawn in Europe, which means our farmers can't use them, compounded by the fact we don't have a, currently an efficient regulatory system to bring replacement technologies to the market. Do you see any particular crop pest matrices in the country at the moment, particularly at risk for not having suitable solutions in the, in the next year or two? Uh, are there any critical areas that, that you see we should be aware of as the industry association uh, and the members supplying the products into the agricultural industry? Hello, Rod, and uh, and your and the rest of your group. Yes, uh, we've been looking at this. Uh, you know what the implications are of the removal of certain other chemicals across the globe, <clears throat> what it impacts, what it what it has in store for us, and the two areas that that I would like uh, to uh, to highlight. And I'm standing to be corrected by my colleagues in the audience, but the two areas that I certainly like to focus on first. Firstly, is, is botryticides in the case of table grapes and, and some other top fruit as well. We have a very limited uh, arsenal of compounds that we at the present moment can, can use. And we are seeing more and more overuse of the so-called SDHIs. I'm pretty sure everyone in the audience knows what the SDHI group of chemicals are. And, um, and uh, they are very prone to resistance. And we could very quickly, we could in the nearby future, see a demise in their efficacy very easily. The next area that have come to, to, to mind at the moment, I think is, uh, well, obviously there are other, there are other uh, fungi, uh, fungi and, uh, and bacteria problems that we are facing. But the most prominent ones, I think, at the moment would be the botrytocytes. The second thing that I would like to highlight is, is, um, is uh, the, the problem with uh, phytosanitary pests. We are more and more and more seeing phytosanitary pests coming to the fore. Or we seeing pests coming to the fore that we, um, that we do not have a solution for at the moment and that are being re regarded as phytosanitary problems because they only occur uh, in and around South Africa or they, they have been introduced in the country by as new pests, we do not have uh, solutions for those at the present moment, and we certainly need some form of, um, of let's say, uh, fast tracking as far as uh, as far as our regulations are con our regulatory issues are concerned to ensure that we that we get a quick solution for those. Otherwise, it will just diminish our possibility or uh, ability to to compete internationally. And the third area that I would like to mention, which is acute and has come about just recently due to the demise of chlorpyrifos, is, uh, is of course mealybug and scale insects. We are seeing an uprise in mealybug problems, especially in citrus and also in our soft fruit, deciduous fruit areas. And we certainly need to address that very, very quickly. Otherwise, we will be 
we will be left with basically one compound that we can use, and that's also an organophosphate, also deregistered in Europe at the moment. And we certainly cannot live with that situation. May I say to the um, uh, to the benefit of our reg registrar, we've recently received a writing from him. In fact, on Friday, we received a writing you know, with a very positive line at the bottom of the letter, which says, if the industry could put forward uh, some suggestions for registration to cure the millibug and scale insects in the absence of chlorpyrifos, he would consider that, he would consider to fast track that. You know, that's very positive. And I think it's something to be applauded. We will be calling on industry. If I say we, you, the rod from crop life, will pretty soon be, will be calling on industry to specifically ask them for contributions which we can put forward to the registrar. And I can go on forever and a day, but I think tea time is about on top of us and we should respect the need of the people rather than keep on talking. Thank you, Rod and Wandili. You are not yet relieved to, to, to go for tea. Hopefully you can, you can be with us for, for a few more minutes. Uh, I, I'm looking um, for, 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 for hands in the room to see if there's some questions, and we're already seeing those. And before I get to the questions that are, that are in the room, Julia, I want to come to you, um, and you have some points to make um, in here, but I would like you to link them with one broad uh, uh, point. I mean, you're sitting there, um, you are CEO of Crop Life International, which allows you to look broader into the world um, and really look at some of the macro trends that, that, that are out there. And what I would like to, to, to hear is whether sentiment as far as the investments in the agriculture an accelerated trend because what we observed, for example, during the health crisis was the fact that there was a lot of money and innovation and optimism about uh, research and, and spending on research in that area. Now then with food security back on the global agenda, I would like you to really comment on that to mix up with some of the comments that you were about to make. Thanks, Julia. I have to ask you to repeat the question because the line was not very clear on my end. So I apologize <laughs> because I didn't uh, hear the full question. So do you mind to repeat the question? Thank you so much. Julia, the, the, the and, sentiment that I, I wanted to get is whether you are seeing um, uh, a change in, in, in as far as investments in technology within the agricultural sector. And I was making an example of the health sector where when the pandemic started, we saw many people rallying behind and putting money and really being open to technology. And I, w I wonder now that with food being back on the global agenda, if there's going to be even more openness uh, for us to, to, to actually use a couple of technologies and also spending within the technology, the technology side. And I'm presenting this broad general question to you because you have a benefit of looking globally in some of these things. That's the question, Julia, I would like you to link with the remarks you were about to make. Thanks, uh, Wadnil. Thanks. Great question. It allows also me to comment uh, on previous uh, important points that uh, Rod and uh, people from the audience uh, made in terms of uh, future of technologies, of future of genetity, and uh, you know whether sustainability is uh, there is a dichotomy of sustainability yes or no because it's also this is so links back to to the investment piece um so let me say uh we don't see a crop life international with our ceo sustainability as a dichotomy it's actually is an integrated approach uh we see that uh, you know what we do uh, to protect the industry in terms of license to operate and what we do in forward looking to is sustainability innovation are, have to be coherent. And uh, sustainability nurture also the position in, on, uh, on the, in, the license to operate of the industry. And at the center lies innovation. Innovation in agriculture for a sustainable future. We cannot take this for granted. We have to push innovation at the very center stage of everything we do. If we don't champion this together, with our partners, farmers, etc., is not going to come uh, 
easily, right? So uh, this is links back to investments because if we can put again agriculture, innovation and agriculture at the center stage of everything we do, a global, a regional level, uh, future COP, uh, COPs and engagement, uh, uh, we we cannot also we cannot foster the investment piece. So, we need more public and private investments because our industry is certainly leading in R&D and technologies, but we know it's not enough. We need also public-private coming more together. We need mechanism to buffer you know, what it means in terms of investment in agriculture and make it uh, bigger at, at scale. And we need that these investments with an enabling environment allows to deploy the benefits of the investments on R&D and technology. So we need to build an old ecosystem and that requires some more efforts so, so on our end as an industry to step up and talk about the positive contributions we can make by working together. Uh, and this is something that it doesn't come automatically. I think we need to really to, to make the case in, in a collective and, and uh, vocal way. Um, and uh, uh, because, you know, the, the, the our challenges and the opportunities before us are, are, uh, are there and we need to grab that. Also, I wanted to uh, also to build on previous comments on the gene editing. We will expect the EU to come up with a policy on gene editing that will link the gene editing to sustainability. Uh, so what do we do? How we can address this uh, in advance? Uh, a link with the investment piece uh, is, uh, is crucial. So we need more and we need uh, more scale. We need more impacts. Uh, each of us needs, needs to do its part. Thank you so very much, uh, uh, Julia, for for those for, for those points. And I think the the audience and everyone uh, that is in 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 the hall here really takes that to heart. Thank you so much. We are heading towards closing, but there is a hand that is here at the hall, and in fact, two hands. We're going to start there, and then we come back to you. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my question is towards uh, Dr. Samir. In essence, it's also to you, Rod, because it will go down to South Africa, in essence. Um, going back to the Green Deal, in your discussions, EU-Africa discussions, one of your slides, you spoke about um, strengthening access to local language labels. Um, that's what you guys are recommending. Um, when you look at experience, it's easier when you look at other sub-Saharan African countries, for instance, East Africa, um, you can have a language, um, a label with English and, and Swahili. You go to West Africa, where most of the people there speak French, so you can have English and French. But if you move to the SADC region, which, um, you know, the southern countries, where you have most countries, South Africa, for instance, or um, Namibia or Zimbabwe, they have quite a number of languages. South Africa, I mean, we have 11 local languages. How do you look at that as a recommendation? Because, for instance, a few years ago, South Africa would have English and Afrikaans in our labels, which was good for the farmers. But when you look at the people that work in the farms and actually use the product, um, they in essence, don't speak Afrikaans anymore, and we're moving away from that. But how do you pick, because now we have this recommendation, how do we pick a sort of local language for Southern Africa, African countries um, to sort of move along with the recommendations that we're trying to make in these discussions with, with the EU? Um, and also another level to add is we're moving away now, we're moving towards globally harmonized systems, where in our labels we're moving away from color bands, where it was easier for people in the farms to look at a red band, oh, this is really dangerous, you know, that kind of thing, we're moving away from that. How do we now, have you guys looked at possible solutions of, in that recommendation, how do you look at certain Africa countries, for instance? Dr. Samira and, and Rod, in essence, thanks. Thank, thank you so, so much. Dr. Samira, uh, while we move to the second uh, question, perhaps maybe you could start. Yeah, thank you for the question. So maybe I can uh, take it um, um, largely uh, for my reference. I, 
for us, we, we are looking to unlock the sustainable transformation and for in Africa, and we need for that to strengthen our institution. We need to enable all government of agribusiness and increase investment to accelerate this agricultural transformation. For that, Africa requires implementation of the regulatory reform that's adapted to its environments. So we, we, we need to um, work together with as private sector, with the public, affair, with the public sector to um, improve our regulatory reforms, our regulatory policy that can be adapted to our the needs of our farmers to uh, to offer to them opportunity for prosperity and for healthy future we we are working as uh, and we stand up as industry to 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 be partner in all the capacity building and to strengthen as an institution um, that can enable uh, the environment uh, for um, uh, sustainable transformation so we also we stand up as partner to to work for the harmonization system in sub, uh, sub uh, regional um, in Africa we, we we want also to be a partner for all the capacity regarding the harmonization of, of, of libeling like GHS and I know that so, uh, South Africa is in, in good progress here and regarding um, uh, the smallholder farmers we need also to to support them with the necessary tools that can um, uh, help them to use efficiently and in the responsible way uh, all the technologies a solution th th thanks so much um, uh, Samira Rod before we move to the to the question if you could just add on to that yeah, so I'll, I think I'll start first on the, the local language labels. Um, I don't think it necessarily means we've got to have a regionally acceptable label. I think it's more a case of don't just import a label from Europe or, or elsewhere in the world that's got an English label and put it on the local market. So uh, I think it's, it's more a case of is the product fit for purpose in the country rather than just bringing something in. And then on the GHS, I think if um, anyone in this room who's, who's seen what Fakile and the GHS committee has been trying to do for the last, well, you could even go back three years if you really want to go back to it. But anyway, um, if, you, if you see what, what that's trying to do is, yes, there, there is a globally acceptable um, standard for, for GHS, but can we influence the local regulators to have um, uh, local tweaks that, that make more sense? And I think going forward with, with lots of things we've spoken about with the Green Deal, with um, Samira talking about interaction with the, the African Union and the European Union, it's back to the same thing. At local level, we have to try and influence the local regulators as much as possible. Yes, we need international standards, but we also need to keep things real for our own, our own market and our own country. And Laurie said it numerous times, don't come in with policy that's good for one part of the world and it's uh, absolutely negative impact in the rest. So for me, it's back down to trying to influence our regulators, which uh, not that easy, but uh, we, have a, we have a lofty aim. Uh, th th thanks, Rod. We have the last question for you, sir. Thank you, Andile. My question's to one of the, uh, the crop life ladies. Uh, Quibus outlined very clearly the constraints that our farmers are having to deal with, with the, the products we're losing. And I don't share his optimism, I'm afraid, when you refer to the, the red scale and, and mealybug, that there might be a, a solution that could be fast-tracked. But the question is, internationally, is crop life lobbying? Or are you able to lob lobby to retain some of the chemistry which is being lost? not always for sound reasons, scientific reasons, or even on a, on a health basis, or is that not your place? And is it a, perhaps a futile exercise to, to try and lobby to retain some of that chemi chemicals, uh, especially in Europe? Thanks. That, that, thank you so very much for that. Uh, Julia, can we, can we uh, base that uh, to you, 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 your CEO, CropLife? Um, uh, international, perhaps you, you, you're well suited to assist us with this question. Yeah, and I would like to um, also ask Laurie to comment so that because she's very close to the EU, um, to the EU agenda. So I, I, I would say 
we we see this uh, uh, working with crop life europe uh, laurie will explain uh, more in detail we see the the engagement with the eu very very closely so uh, we we like to to say we we advocate and we work to you know very closely to make sure that our voice is heard but also our we, we protect our our uh, products but also we provide alternatives too so it's a very very thorough approach of engaging which is i would say it goes beyond lobbying so it's engaging advocating and working very closely uh, but i will pass on to Lori that she can provide more uh, detailed on uh, specific uh questions around, for instance, MRL and other things. Laurie, back to you. Sure, thank you, Julia. Yes, and that's an excellent question. And I think one of the strengths that we have at Crop Life is the Crop Life Network. And so Samira is here on the call as well, and she can certainly also speak to this, but we do have a number of committees at the international level that allow us to engage with all parts of the world. Because as we've discussed this morning, a policy in the EU has broad implications all around the world and that are especially felt keenly in the export markets. And so, uh, yes, this is very core to everything we do. And this idea about impacts and trade-offs is also really important to our discussions as we have these globally. So. Crop Life Europe is the lead on all things in Europe, and we uh, work very closely, and Samira and I are frequently on uh, calls and <laughs> discussions with our colleagues in Europe uh, around what are they doing, but there's also an opportunity for uh, third countries to get engaged in these discussions. And on some of these import tolerance discussions, we recently had um, a policy uh, put out by the EU around mirror clauses. And I'm sure as an export facing group, you guys were probably all familiar with, with, that, um, with that policy that was out for discussion. So what we do at Kreplif International is we frequently try to align on some of those key messages, uh, not the exact wording, but the key messages that we want to make sure that um, we as associations are putting forward from a private sector perspective but also making sure that the respective governments where you all work and for your case in South Africa are aware of some of these challenges that policies that might happen in one part of the world could have in other parts. And so we have task forces uh, directed to MRLs. We have a broad conversation and we've talked with Chantal uh, very closely around some of the, um, the, 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 uh, the GMO discussions around plant biotechnology and the importance of aligning and being cohesive all around the world if we're ever um, able to have open and fair trade. So yes, that's a very long answer to say absolutely. We are trying our best to have cohesion and influence uh, from a global perspective on some of these specific domestic policies. Th thank you so very much, Laurie. Uh, thanks to uh, uh, Dr. Samira. Uh, Julia and Cobas, uh, I know many of you had to wake up, particularly you, Laurie, very early to join us um, onto this. The, the people joined us in the audience. If you didn't have an opportunity to pose some of the questions, uh, you all know Rob's email address or Elizra's email address. You can send some of the points in there. They will definitely uh, make sure that they convey those to the Crop Life Network. So we're very thankful uh, for making the time and everyone that has joined the session online, we're thankful for that. We're gonna go for a coffee break. We're also thankful to everyone um, that has uh, joined us here in the hall. And for myself, on our side at Agbiz, uh, we, we're very thankful that, Rob, you could involve us um, in this particular session. So thank you. <laughs>